Hey guys, Morgan Jilks here on the Physical Performance Show, JC FMX Rider. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show. The show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Listeners, welcome to another episode of the Physical Performance Show. I'm your host, Brad Beer, and on today's episode, I catch up with Morgan Jilks, freestyle motocross rider for the JC Epidemic. This is a story that'll touch you. It's a story of overcoming, it's a story of rising to the top, it's a story of redefining your life as it goes, as we all go through the highs and the lows, the valleys and the troughs. It's a young gentleman with wisdom well beyond his years. I know you're going to really enjoy this insight into the world of freestyle motocross and what it takes to overcome and prevail in life. So let's jump straight in. So listeners, sitting with me today is a uh is an athlete, and not just a, an athlete that I respect and admire, but one that is a great guy, uh, who incidentally, his uh, amazing wife's part of the physiotherapy, t- uh, sorry, part of the Pogo physio team here uh, for listening. She's a much love uh, face around the practice. So uh, you're kind of like family around these uh, around this building, Morgan, so welcome along. Cheers, thanks Brad, it's good to be here. Like to start, Morgs, with something straight out of the gate to get you thinking, and that is, what's one thing that scares Morgan Jilks? Oh, geez. Um, one thing that scares me or one thing that has scared me? One thing that scares you, and then we'll go the other way as well. <laughs> um, probably, probably failing, I think. Not reaching my goals or my dreams that I've set out to do, and uh, yeah, stuff in life where you, you know you can achieve and you want to achieve, but... Um, there's always bumps and uh, hard things along the way to be able to get there, but uh, to be able to push through that is the, one of my biggest things. It scares me to uh, to probably not be able to do that. Really, yeah. What is it about about failing that, that scares you though? Probably the fact that not only letting other people down, but I feel like I let myself down. So uh, I know that the goals that I have set are reachable, and I know it's going to take time. But I know to be able to get there, it's going to take a lot of sacrifice and dedication. And that includes family and friends and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, really just if I don't, if I know I can get somewhere and I don't, yeah, that's what I think that's the scariest thing in my life at the moment. Has there been an instance, Morgan, in your career, your FMX uh, career, where you did feel like you missed the mark and failed? Um, no, not really. Not so far. Not since I... Uh, in my FMX career, everything went really, really fast. And a lot of things happened really quick for me because of my motivation, which we'll dig into a bit later. But, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a tough time in my life starting that and then going through that, being able to push through that tough time. I think that's, that's what's given me the motivation to be able to push through. And uh, I think not being able to push through something, that's what would really, yeah, that's what scares me, I think. So yeah. it drives me to push harder. And so, Morgan, let's let's go back to the start then of... Uh, you grew up where? I grew up in Newcastle, New South Wales. Yep. And uh, you were born into a, a family of... of uh, how, how many siblings? Uh, two siblings. So yep. an older sister and a younger brother. Yep. So so you were uh, smack bang in the middle? Yeah, right in the middle. Yep. And uh, what was life like growing up through those early days? Yeah, it was awesome. I always had Tyrone, which was my younger brother, chasing me, and we always had Samantha going out to do everything and get in trouble first. So it was uh, it was a lot of fun being the middle child, and uh, yeah, we just really enjoyed each other's company. We were just like a normal family, really, that liked extreme sports, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So so talk me th- talk to listeners and myself about that liked extreme sports. When did that start to manifest in the Jukes household? Yeah, for sure. Um, probably pretty much since we were born. 
me and my brother and my sister, we're all really competitive kind of people. And uh, yeah, since we were born, dad, I think I rode my first motorcycle at three years old. So um, we uh, started all from there pretty much, yeah, three years old and then onwards. And we just began to get bigger and faster and bigger motorbikes come with that. So then we started jumping further and doing more crazy stunts, really. And so um, so the jumps and stunts, were these just over little backyard uh, moulds of dirt, mounds of dirt? Yeah, yeah, at the start it was. So uh, we would build our little jumps out the back and Dad would come out and help us and then got to the point where Dad had to bring his machine into the backyard and we had a little reserve out the back. So we'd, uh, we'd build, a, build some jumps and these got bigger and bigger, I think. So uh, what was mum's reaction while all this was happening? Uh, she was okay when it was in the backyard, so it wasn't, couldn't get too out of control. Uh, I think it was when we started to get onto the farms and the biggest kind of areas, that's when uh, she started to get a little bit worried. And your sister, what was her name, Morgan? Uh, my sister's Samantha. Samantha. Samantha, what was Jilks, yeah. S- Samantha Jilks. So Samantha was watching Tyrone and yourself. Uh, yeah. The gap between you as brothers was how yeah. many years? It was about a year, just over a year. So you're very close in age. Yeah, yeah. Um, Samantha's watching you boys presumably push each other to you know to all sorts of uh, limits. Yeah. Um, what was Samantha doing throughout all this these uh, formative years on the motorbikes? Um, Samantha was just being a girl, I think. <laughs> we never really. Um, she kind of just jumped in with everything. So it was a it was a big family kind of thing, big family environment, I'd say. So when we would uh, go racing on the weekend, Samantha would always be there. Uh, when we'd be building jumps out the back, Samantha would be out the back with a shovel or trying to do something funny. So uh, she would always try and jump in and join in and have some fun. But she was always really good at swimming, which she is still. So not quite an ag- extreme sport, but uh, still a great athlete. And does she still swim? How far did she go with the swimming, Morgan? She went to uh, squad training and then she went up to, uh, I think she was swimming for regionals and states when she was a bit younger, before she left high school. And then after that, she uh, uh, joined the Air Force. So that's where she's at the moment. She's really enjoying it. Okay, so great. So, um, all right, so you're on the motorbike young. Yeah. Um, what's life like beyond that? I mean, you get to a point at 2009 uh, mm-hmm. where you head off to the Defence Force, yep. to the Army. But uh, take us through that journey uh, of your time on motorbikes. Yeah, so uh, as I said, we grew up always racing on weekends. So, um me and Tyrone would pack up the trailer the night before on a Saturday night and then on a Sunday the whole family would head out, me, Mum, Samantha and Tyrone and Dad. Uh, we'd head out to the track on a Sunday and uh, go racing for the day. Uh, during the week Dad would pick us up from school early if we could and uh, we'd head off to a track about 40 minutes away from our house and we'd uh, do a bit of riding and practicing and training. Um, from there it just really progressed as we got older and bigger. We got onto bigger bikes, we got faster bikes which comes more need more property i guess so it didn't just cut it being out in the the reserve in the backyard anymore so um yeah we started building bigger jumps and uh getting a lot more a lot more into it a lot more expensive uh at an age of about um i think my brother was nine years old we uh dad ended up buying us a, a freestyle ramp so a wooden ramp a steel ramp with wood on top of it to a dirt landing uh, from there, Tyrone and myself, we started jumping and having a little bit of fun, and it was it was awesome. Like we would uh, we would uh, push each other to go further and further, and then we ended up one day. Tyrone ended up jumping 100 feet at the age of nine years old to set a new world record on a KX a KDM 65 motorcycle. So, and to clarify, 100 feet uh, in terms of distance. Yeah. Yeah. It's off a, a, boom, off yeah. Yeah. So 30, 32 and a half meters. And that would have needed an approach speed of approximately what, Morgs? Oh, it would have been around 60 kilometres an hour, that, okay. for the ramp that we had. And it wasn't the best setup. The landing was in between two trees, so... But it was, uh, yeah, it was fun. I think it taught us a lot in the early age. So uh, was there a certified uh, thing that needed to happen for it to be a world record or it was a matter of, you know, obviously be authentic about it and submit it? And yeah, it yeah, record. so we tried to submit it and... Um, there was a lot of sites that submitted in the motorcycle world, but um, a lot the Guinness Book of Records wouldn't actually recognise it because Tyrone was too young, they, because it was such an extreme sport and so dangerous, they wouldn't recognise it until Tyrone turned 18. 
So, uh, yeah, he was just goes to show we were very young at the time when this was all happening. Wow, so he was half the age of what needed to be, to yeah, be, yeah. be counted. What was mum doing when uh, Tyro was flying through the air at uh, eight, nine years of age, jumping 30 metres off a 60k approach? Yeah, I'd say yeah. that's when she started getting a bit scared. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was dad to see going, that's my boy. Yeah, yeah, so dad loved it. And he always made it as safe as it could be and he never pushed us in a way that we didn't want to be pushed. He always made sure we wanted to do it. And I think that was the reason why we have gone so far with the sport, for yeah. sure. So you never felt pressured? No, not at all, no. Yeah. So um, was there any... Uh, how far did you go with your, your motocross um, life before you jumped into the Defence Force? How old were you when you joined the Army? So I joined the Army as soon as I turned 17. Okay, so when you were 17. Yep. Um, so Morgan, um, yeah, were you just pure pure recreation up until that point joining the Army? Yeah, so Tyrone began jumping and making records and he got in a lot into the more freestyle kind of side of motorbike riding. I was always a racer, so I'd always, on the Sundays when we went racing, that's when I would try and put in my biggest effort. And that's when I made a lot of my um, my name known, I guess, in the sport. And from the ages, from about from about 10 to 17 is when I made my biggest mark. And that's when I was racing all around Australia, doing the Australian titles, the New South Wales state championships and stuff like that. And really uh, trying to push the sport and push myself in the sport. And uh, up until 17, I think my last year, I was, yeah, I was riding around New South Wales, the state titles and the Aussie titles. And then the year after that I, is when I joined the Army. Yeah, wow. And as you joined the Army, could you continue to ride bikes? So, yeah, when I joined the Army, they said that I would be able to do a little bit, but uh, I kind of slipped away a little bit because of all the training stuff we have to do. And then by the time all that was done, it kind of went all so fast. It was four and a half years was gone. I'd only ridden a motorbike about three or four times in them four and a half years. So Morgan, uh, you're only on a bike a few times through your, your time in the Army. Um, what was the uh, catalyst to come out of, to come out of the defence force? Yeah, so when I was in the army, I still tried to ride as much as I could, but it just obviously didn't happen. When I was in the army, um, my brother Tyrone pursued the sport even more and began freestyle motocross, so um, doing the tricks, doing backflips and riding shows. And um, Tyrone became actually quite good, and in a span of about two years, he became pretty much the top of Australia in the sport. And um, from that, I, I could see Tyrone riding all the time, and I'd want to ride, but... I was always away with the army and that, away living out in the bush or shooting guns somewhere. It was always fun, but watching him progress really um, really was inspiring to watch. Mm. Um, during this time, Tyron set um, three more world records on an 85cc motorcycle, a 125cc motorcycle, and he was also the youngest person to ever flip a motorcycle to dirt. Um, so after all this had kind of gone on and I was in the army on March 2013 Tyron was due to set the world record long distance world record on a 250cc motorcycle uh, the record was 310 feet which is a football field it's about 105 meters so um, on the day Tyron was practicing leading up to the day that he was meant to break the world record which was on the 21st of March 2013. This is on Australian soil? Yeah yeah so this was in Maitland about 40 minutes from Newcastle and um, I was on that day jumping out of the back of planes actually and parachuting that day which was a lot of fun and then uh, yeah I got a call saying that Tyron had had an accident and um, so I left straight away went home and grabbed my wife and we drove straight to Newcastle from Sydney where I was at the time. Uh, when we got there, Tyrone was, um, Tyrone was in surgery, so we knew it wasn't in, he wasn't in a good way. And uh, when we come to hospital, mum and dad and a lot of our friends and support crew were in the chapel and they were all just they were praying and uh, just being there for each other. When we got there, we knew it wasn't good and we got taken up to a room and Tyrone, they said that Tyrone was hanging on to life by pretty much his fingertips. And uh, that was hard to take, but they it kind of gave us a little bit of hope. Yeah, wow. So this, uh, so this is all when you're in the military, in the defence force. Yeah, um, yeah. And you'd been obviously like any you know proud but competitive brother. Uh, you know, following your brother's uh, accomplishments, building a, yeah, a growing yeah. portfolio of them. Yeah. And then uh, you know, no major mishaps along the way with all those previous records. Yeah. No. And then the. You know, you get a, a call to say your brother's had an accident. Did you know what the accident involved? I knew 
uh, when my sister called, she was very quick on the phone. I could tell she was panicking a lot, so I knew that it wasn't good. And the distance at time was jumping, and nothing can ever be good when you have an accident at that kind of distance and speed. So, because what would have the approach speed been for such a jump? The approach speed, I'm not sure on that one because I, I wasn't there on the day, but it would have been around 130 kilometers an hour. Wow. So, and the ramp height, Morgan, would be? Uh, the ramp height was about, I think it was 12 to 14 feet high. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so, um, and so something went wrong on the landing I presume yeah yeah so Tyne ended up not making just on top of the jump and he's uh, come collided with the top of the landing uh, with that pace and uh, the speed that he collided with the landing it ripped a artery out of Tyne's heart and uh, began bleeding inside and he was pretty much pretty much passed away there and then on the spot um, when we got to the hospital he was on life support and we got to uh, say goodbye, all the family, and while we were around him. And, uh, yeah, as we were around Tyrone, he passed away on the 21st of, uh, 21st of March 2013, which was a big, big changing turning point in my life. Because you were how old at that stage, Morgan? I was 21. I was due to turn 21 three days after Tyrone passed away. Yeah. So I was 20 at the time. And Tyrone was only 19. Tyrone was 19. Yeah. Um, and so, so uh, family, obviously, you know, uh, your sister, yourself, mum, dad, all your, you know, uh, Felicity, your wife. Um, mm-hmm. Yep. Um, everyone there. I mean, uh, what do you what what do you do next in terms of I mean not motorbike you know motorcycle career but uh, I mean how do you how did you regroup and what have, what have been the steps in the years that have followed in trying to come to to grips with this Yeah yeah well after it happened it was a huge shock it was a huge eye opener it pretty it turned our lives all around like we didn't expect this it was a sudden sudden death and that was the hardest thing about it not seeing anything like this happening, not being able to say goodbye, not being able to uh, to be able to, yeah, mainly just be there. And uh, so from there, it was a few months later, it took, took years, it's still healing now, but um, a few months, a month later, me and my dad went overseas and to see all Tyron's sponsors and meet and do a meet and greet and um, explain to them what had happened and Obviously, everyone knew, but it was good to get over there and just be around the kind of people Tyron was around before he passed away, which was really good. From there, when I was over in America, I think we went to a motorcycle event called Red Bull X Fighters. And when we were there, I really felt the urge to actually want to ride and get on a bike. So when we got back, me and Dad, uh, I saved, had saved up a bit of money in the army. So uh, we drove up to me and my wife, Felicity, drove up to the Gold Coast, jumped in the car from Sydney and drove up one weekend to uh, buy one of the bikes off the Team Tyron Road for, which was JC Epidemic. And from there, we brought the bike home and I started riding the next week after I was home pretty much and uh, started to progress and uh, get use the motivation and the the heartbreak to be able to push through a lot of boundaries and barriers a lot quicker than a lot of people do in the world of freestyle motocross because you've been off the bike for three three four four and a bit years right yeah i mean jumping on it maybe recreationally but Mm -hmm. not so was there i mean i could only imagine you've just you know had the heartbreaking loss of your brother due to an accident on the bike um uh, it must how do you uh, is there not a high level of anxiety around you know um an accident for yourself let alone i imagine the you know the you know your mum and you know your close family uh were they all just supportive because they just felt that there was a sense of uh, purpose to it as well yeah, I don't think they definitely weren't supportive at the start or not they were always supportive but they definitely they didn't feel the same way. Though it was it was scary and for them to see what had happened and now for me to get back on the bike and start to do exactly what Tyron was doing was uh, it was scary. Mum and dad it was really hard for mum and dad. It was really hard for my wife listening and my sister and a lot of our family. Um, but when I got on the bike, I think that's when I felt most at home. That's when none, nothing hurt anymore. I didn't feel the pain as much. I really felt connected with Tyrone just through riding because I hadn't ridden for so long. So I really helped getting back on the bike really helped me come through the heartbreak and uh, push through and be able to come the 
uh, get to the top of the sport a lot quicker than a lot quicker than other people. So how long did it take you then, Morgs, to get to, as you just say, the top of the sport, freestyle motocross? Yeah, so I started riding about three months after Tyrone passed away. And then from there, pretty much till I stopped riding was exactly a bit over two years, just over two years. And Tyrone had gone to the top of the sport in about two and a half years. And we were always competitive with each other. So dad and me had a bet that we could um we wanted to get there as fast as Tyron did and that was really hard because Tyron's the first to do it in the world pretty much to get there as quick as he did and so we set ourselves a goal and we really used the motivation and worked together as a team and uh yeah got there it took me about two about a year and eight months to get to where Tyron was in Australia so it was uh eye-opening and and when you say top of the sport for the uninitiated um morgan in terms of the the sport uh when you say get to the top of the sport what Mm -hmm. do you mean by that so get to the top of the sport means you're doing tricks that the guys on the world stage are doing so to be able to get to that stage within australia is really hard Uh, australia's freestyle uh, doesn't have a lot of backing there's a lot of not too much money in it whereas overseas is a little bit more but because it's such an extreme sport and there's so little people doing it it's hard to be able to make a living off it Mm. so i went from working the army full time to uh using them savings i guess to uh fund a freestyle motocross career for the first six months when i was learning Mm. whilst my wife felicity worked and she gave me the opportunity and my family gave me the opportunity to be able to pursue that full time after six months i started to get a little bit of shows and earn a little bit more money so to be able to ride full-time freestyle motocross is to be able to it's to be at the top of the sport in australia so it's yeah it's cool so, it's really so you got there in in that you know that in 18 months or so yeah yeah um and and morgan uh this the difference between motocross and freestyle motocross yeah so motocross and supercross is racing around a track it's timed it's a certain amount of laps and to see who can finish go for the finish line first kind of like a running race and then freestyle motocross is kind of like um the break dancing of the world so you go out and you express yourself on the motorcycle by doing uh backflips backflip variations combinations uh off a 75 foot jump so it's about 22 meters wow yeah so and that's where you were playing that's yeah, that was yeah. your that was your playground your yeah. dance floor yeah that's it and and so morgan uh what uh talk listeners through and myself What's going through your head as you're about to launch into a, uh, a particular jump? I mean, uh, a gentleman that I, I remember asking through my work as a physiotherapist here about a backflip. Um, yeah. You know, one of your mutual friends in the um, in the in the you know motor, motocross world. What's going through your head when you do a backflip? This is before we'd met, and yeah. I remember this gentleman saying, um, "Every time you've got to really, uh, I can't remember if he said psych, but you've got to really." zero in because it's not like you just do it all the time and it's just automatic yeah is that the case what goes through your head when you're trying to try that next new trick yeah for sure well my first ever backflip i actually um i actually did straight to a dirt landing so most people these days they practice backflips into a foam pit so you'd land in a put the ramp there and you'd jump and land into a pit of foam so it's a lot safer to be able to learn that way my first ever backflip was uh, in up in Mackay at my first ever competition. I'd never, I'd only been riding freestyle for three months at that time, and uh, I said to the guys in the competition and a lot of my friends that if I was able to get my run just perfect and get all my tricks out that I had at that time, I would, um, I would try and do a backflip at the end. And they all laughed and thought it was funny, and um, I didn't think I would be actually able to put together a run at that time because I'd only been riding freestyle for a little bit. And uh, yeah, I ended up putting together the run really well. And we come down onto the home stretch where there's two jumps in a row. And I rolled the first jump, so just rolled over the top. And as I come into the second jump, you can see on the film, all the crowd stands up and all my teammates start running out. And I uh, pulled back and landed my first ever backflip straight to dirt without ever doing one on a motorcycle before. So that was probably the scariest one and it just took a lot of motivation and being able to see my destination before it actually happened. I think that was the biggest thing. See the destination as in that bit of dirt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As in because you'd seen it, you'd you know, you'd been able to literally view it. Yeah, yeah. So I literally tried to picture it in my head before it happened and then uh, 
try and follow through thinking I'd already done it. So what's going through your head as you're up in the air and the bike's starting to get head backwards <laughs> over your... Uh, over your uh... Oh, that first one, I don't remember anything. <laughs> it pretty much went black until I landed and there's, there's video of it and I didn't, I didn't actually throw my hands up until about 50 metres after the landing because I, I couldn't believe what actually just happened. Yeah, wow. And is the backflip more than a, 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 I guess, a trophy of freestyle motocross? Is it still something that's, you know, is it? Yeah, for sure. Well, you need a lot of people. After that, I went to a foam pit and I practiced at the longer distance. So my first backflip was at about 40 foot. And then you learn and you go get the distance increased and you go to 75 feet. Do you mean distance in terms of ramp height or in terms of length? In terms of, in terms of length, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. So to be able to flip 75 is a, is, a, is a really big accomplishment in the sport and it's a really big divider in the sport. Yep. So, um, yeah, to be able to get to that point is uh, every time you ride, it's kind of a scary thing after from that point on. And what about the, the jumps where, you know, you guys are letting go of body bits and uh, holding on with one hand and you'd have all the names for them. I just yeah, look, yeah. At, look at it as a as a admirer of uh, what you guys can do and just go, that's cool. I don't know the names. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Um, what are the, what are the, what's the repertoire of your, your favorite tricks? What were they? Describe in words. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, probably, there was a lot of uh, favorite tricks for sure, but um, I think it took a lot of... Uh, guts really to do it it's a lot of uh, mental takes a lot on your mental toll it takes a big mental toll and uh, to be able to do them all the time so every time you ride it's like coming to work so you're going to work and you're just you're doing something at work you're either like yourself being a physiotherapist working on people whereas I'd go to work and I'd uh, be back flipping 75 feet on my motorcycle upside down hanging on by my hands kind of thing and uh, it was a big mental toll but I think my favourite trick would have been it's called a cordova backflip so it's where you when you go off the ramp and when you're upside down you put your feet on the handlebars and you push your whole body through the handlebars and you make like an it's what you'd see like an arc shape i guess and uh you look at the landing and it's really the your perception really gets blown out of proportion because you're upside down but because you've been around so much your head's actually looking at the landing so your body's the right way up it's a, it's a really weird trick, but um, definitely one of the funnest. Wow. So that's what called a what? A Cordova. Yeah, Cordova backflip. Cordova backflip. I didn't yeah. tell you, but I'm out the back doing a few of those at lunch <laughs> and on my break. So. Yeah. <laughs> no, funnily enough, Morgan, my, uh, I think my sport in life started on a, uh, on a motorbike. I don't know if I've ever shared this with you. A Peewee yeah. 50. Yeah. Uh, back in Grafton doing jumps across the road from the skateboard park. And uh, I must have been trying to um, do a world record or something. Yeah. I don't know. I went up and I can't remember it, but the bike came down and landed on my my, my, my jaw and broke my jaw. Yeah. So oh, uh, wow. the Pee Wee 50 was uh, out of the house. No more. <laughs> so, uh, but that was as far as my motorcycle motorcycle world went, mate. But, uh, yeah, yeah. But um, never any, never anything to your magnitude. That's amazing. <laughs> so uh, what were some of the highlights in your time with freestyle motocross? Um, one of my highlights would definitely be the first backflip to do it. Yep. That was uh, that surprised everyone, surprised myself really. Yep. And uh, one of the highlight, another highlight would be um, just doing shows for the same team that my brother rode for. So JC Epidemic, I actually got onto their team as a rider, and uh, just riding with the two other guys that ride for their team, knowing that they'd ridden with Tyron and they'd had a lot of fun and uh, worked together. I think every time we did a show together or I rode with them guys on the weekend, it really pushed me and uh, pushed me to go further in the sport. And uh, yeah, it was nearly every ride was a highlight, I think, because it didn't. I was only doing it for two years, so I really. The whole two years was a highlight for me. It was fun. What was life like in the in the in the motorbike? Sorry, the in the team JC Epidemic. What was uh, like? What would a typical month look like in there for you guys? How many guys are in the team? And yeah, so there's another two riders, uh, Pete Anderson and Joe Shepherd, and they both ride for the the freestyle motocross part of JC Epidemic. We also have BMX guys and skateboarders and uh, a few dancers actually, and. Um, yeah, so a normal month would kind of look like we'd start the month and um, we'd try and get as many shows as we can. So if that involves driving, we drive a portable setup so it has a landing and a takeoff ramp and we can drive that and pretty much set it up anywhere where there's enough ground. So where there's about 50 metres of flat ground we can, uh, or 100 metres, we can set this jump up 
and uh, we can perform tricks wherever we go. So uh, it involve each weekend try, kind of driving somewhere else to put on a show and uh, talk to the talk to the younger people about what we do and how we do it. And uh, yeah, sometimes them drives involved going to Darwin or other places around Australia, but it was always fun the road trips and. Uh, yeah, it was really good. And uh, you'd put a show on for, uh, you know, a publicised show that, you know, the team's coming and they're going to put a show on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We'd put on a show, they'd pay, and we'd uh, come in. And it's kind of like Carnies, I guess, but uh, doing the, the normally the biggest part of the show and the scariest part and the part that everyone loves and sits on the edge of their seat for. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was, it was fun. And uh, Morgan, your body through this, your physical body. Yeah. Um, uh, I spent a little bit of time with you on occasions with a few little niggles. Mm. Um, but was there any major injuries or accidents that you personally sustained in your your time? During the two years of freestyle motocross, I was very blessed that I actually didn't have any major injuries at all. I had a slight uh, medial ligament in my knee tear, not tear, sorry, strain, and that was about it actually. So. I had a few get-offs and uh, a few, a bit of skin off, but I think most of my injuries actually come from when I was racing motorcycles when I was a young, when I was a little young tucker with my brother. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was most of the injuries were then. So, so uh, uh, brothers pushing each other. Yeah, for sure. There was one time when me and Tyron actually broke our legs on the same day. <laughs> oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Talk us through that. How did that happen? So, on the exact same day, I ended up breaking, I, act, I didn't uh, crack my femur but it didn't actually come apart and separate like they normally do. So it cracked and it stayed in place, but it swelled up really bad. And because of the swelling, it kept the bones actually together, the bone together. So femur is a really bad bone to break. And so I was sitting in the car and we thought it was just corked and uh, that it would just come up in a big bruise the next day or something. So I was sitting there waiting and then Tyron ended up jumping, jumping a jump and jumping a little bit too long on his first jump and he uh, broke his tib and fib in his shin bones and uh, we knew Tyrone's leg was broken straight away because it was bananaed out, looked like <laughs> a banana and definitely not meant to look like that. So uh, Tyrone was rushed to the hospital and I sat in the car and then I uh, went to a friend's house while mum and dad were in the hospital with Tyrone and they looked after me and then when we went to pick Tyrone up from the hospital, they, the doctors and the nurse called to look at my leg and uh, they said, you better get an x-ray straight away. So I went in for an x-ray and uh, I was in a brace for the next 12 weeks with Tyrone in a cast next to me on the lounge for 12 weeks. <laughs> on the same, from, broken on the same day. On the exact same day. We both, Tyrone went into surgery and we both come out of the, out of hospital the next day in casts from wow. our hip to our toes. Wow. And uh, so they would have been some classic family photos. Oh, there, there's some funny photos out there. <laughs> <laughs> Great memory, right? Yeah. And, uh, and so Morgan, what was the catalyst to then start to, um, you know, exit out of, freestyle motocross because you'd made the you know the fast rise back to the top of the sport yeah had some highs along the way you know riding with the team you know first backflip to dirt yeah um what 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 was it that made you start to think that it's time to exit after a relatively short space of years which which from the outside in looks short (laughs) but i'm sure sitting on that bike rocking up every day to put yourself to that limit you know in the extreme sense yeah yeah is not short yeah, exactly. It's like I said before, it takes a big mental toll uh, to be able to turn up each and every day, and you have to be really focused to be able to ride at that level. So the top guys, they're practicing the foam pits a lot, whereas I didn't have that opportunity to be able to do that each and every day. So a lot of my practice was to an actual landing where I, could, I couldn't really make a mistake at all. And with a mistake, then it caused injury, and then you're out from the sport, and then that puts your time back even more. So um, I think... Me and my brother always had a thing. We didn't actually want to ride for too long. We always wanted to stop our riding around 24, 25. You'd spoken about this? Yeah, yeah. So not many new people knew that Tyron, Tyron wanted to do that. He actually wanted to buy a barber shop <laughs> and uh, have a barber shop and just have a lot of local customers, I think, and uh, just enjoy his time after riding career. And, um, yeah, so we'd always talked about just not riding for too much longer and after 24 or 25 years old. Because we knew the kind of toll it took on the body and uh, what it took to be at that level. And, uh, yeah, one day I was taking my bike out. I was just, I was 22 years old, so I'd been riding for two years. And um, when I I was putting my bike back in the car after a ride and I really just felt this feeling that um, that I was, my riding career was done. And I just felt, I felt complete and happy with where I'd gotten to in the sport. 
I had had a lot of fun, met a lot of people, and I really think it put me in touch and helped me to be able to overcome my brother's passing. And um, I used, uh, yeah, so I guess once the bike went in the van, I, th- I can remember the day, I think it was February the 8th, and I um, haven't ridden a motorcycle since then, a freestyle motorcycle since then, so... And you it's said, crazy. wow, you said Morgan, um, it helped you deal with, you know, Tyrone's uh, death and passing. Mm. Um, what do you think it was about that process that did help you deal with it? Um, it helped me to be, um, understand, I guess. So to understand what went wrong or what happened on the day of Tyrone's passing. And it helped me to understand what Tyrone was going through while I was away in the army. Because we were really close growing up. And then once I joined the army... Tyrone kind of done his own thing and I lived away from home so I didn't get to see him as much so I think riding really helped me come in touch with what Tyrone actually went through how he lived his life and helped me kind of understand why he did what he did and why he wanted to stop at that young age yeah okay so, yeah and uh and Morgan uh, you haven't ridden a bike since um have you had the desire to but you just haven't done no it? so I've ridden a bike but I haven't I haven't ridden freestyle motocross, so I haven't ridden a uh, yeah, freestyle motocross bike for since that day. But um, I've ridden, I've been riding Harleys a lot with my father. We went over to America and rode Harleys with a group of friends out the back of Las Vegas. And uh, we did a lot of that kind of stuff. So I'm a lot, I'm enjoying riding a lot more now. I'm not pushing it to the edge, I guess. How, how was that? Where'd you go out the back of Vegas? Oh, we went to, uh, I think it was Red Rock out the back and uh we rode around the mountains and uh it was awesome it was one of it's probably one of my highlights of my life i think that trip it was just me dad and a bunch of really close friends and uh yeah we just took a couple of days and uh just went off on the bikes it was awesome and you hired the harleys from vegas yeah yeah we hired from vegas and rode out of town and enjoyed it is this something that you guys had planned for a few years or more spontaneous than that it was kind of spontaneous i think so we went over to watch a, a big event a freestyle motocross event we thought it'd be cool to kind of go over and get together and uh while we we're over there we just thought we'd get on the harleys and go for a ride yeah wow and so uh living the dream yeah it was good morgan uh through your your fmx years uh how did you look after your body i mean you said there was a few spills nothing that was too serious injury wise more the the stuff from your younger years but yeah um how did you look after your physical body you know you can't get on a bike and not be fit yeah that's it that's exactly right and i think I'd always come in and see you, Brad, so it helped out a lot when I had my uh, little niggling injuries, especially with my back a lot because uh, I'm kind of a bit of a taller rider with long limbs. So, And listeners, I must just say it was quite funny. One of the things we do as physios is sort of, hey, what if you've been doing anything out of the norm that you, know, you would equate for this? And I think you presented Morgan with a sore back. And it was like, yeah, I've been doing repetitive backflips or you know, that <laughs> movement. I'm like, okay, that's where maybe we're coming from. So outside of the physiotherapy intervention, what else were you doing to stay in peak, peak shape? Yeah, so after the, um, that, when I, I'd always trained through the Army and uh, I'd, I'd got my personal training certificate through the Army. So uh, when I left the Army, I really wanted to continue training because I knew my body needed to be in top physical form, form to be able to do what I do. So I started uh, doing CrossFit when I got up to the Gold Coast. And a lot of the moves and my coaches with CrossFit have really helped me to be able to learn how to move my body gymnastically. And that's really what you need to be able to do on a motorcycle when riding freestyle motocross. You need that explosive strength and also that um, flexibility. And probably not being scared helped a lot. But um, yeah, so I trained CrossFit a lot, so four to five times a week. And um, since then, I've continued training CrossFit and got my personal training certificate outside of the Army. And now I'm doing that as a job, so with my wife. Fantastic. So this is a new venture for you guys. Yeah. Um, what's, what's, uh, if listeners want to find out more about you and your personal training yeah, um, yeah. business, where can they go? Uh, at 1UP Training um, on Instagram and one up training on Facebook also, or you can go through my name at Morgan Jilks on Instagram and, uh, you'll find all the links and, uh, stuff to that there. Fantastic. And, uh, we'll tag that up listeners in the show notes too. So Morgan, um, new career, uh, new chapter, I guess, uh, yeah. you know, that you're going into any overlap between performing at your best with, uh, FMX and performing at your best with the CrossFit scene. Are you competing? Are you, sorry, tr- training and, 
you know, going competitive with CrossFit or is it more just purely for your own enjoyment? So it was for enjoyment and to keep my body in line whilst I was riding to uh, keep me at the top of the level kind of thing, like we were saying before. And uh, since stopping uh, riding freestyle motocross, I really, I always need a goal. I always need to, uh, I need to have something that I'm working for. And uh, since stopping freestyle motocross, I really enjoyed doing CrossFit. So um, I've now acquired a coach from uh, Canberra, which is now my brother-in-law, which is awesome. And uh, he's Michael Roach, and he does a lot of my training and coaching. And uh, through his training and programming, I've been able to uh, progress very quickly also in CrossFit world. So I'm starting to do competitions next year. I've done a few, just muck around, have fun kind of ones. But I look to be able to compete seriously in a couple of years, maybe three to four years. So it takes a lot more time because I haven't, I didn't do it all my life, like motorcycle riding. But um, I want to put in the effort and uh, work hard and see where I can go with it. What's the dream with CrossFit? I'd be awesome to just make regionals. So regionals is competition in CrossFit. It's pretty much the top of the sport in Australia. From regionals, you go to the CrossFit Games in America. But um, at the moment, I think one step at a time, I've got my eyes set on regionals, obviously in a few years' time. But um, yeah, definitely want to see, see where I can take it. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and no CrossFit injuries thus far for you? I mean, no? No, not yet. Not no. As, as bad as everyone says. No, it's, no. it's been good to me. <laughs> no, and I don't, I don't uh, as a physiotherapist, I, uh, I think all activity is fantastic. So yeah, yeah. Uh, things will happen no matter what the endeavor. That's it. Um, and uh, always sort of cheer physical activity as opposed to sed- you know, a sedentary lifestyle because there's normally more damage done through that than That's there is it. with the musculoskeletal thing things which we can normally always patch up <laughs> um morgan uh through your fmx years one training session that you you particularly remember that you dislike that you would need to do regularly is there one of those um not so much during the fmx probably the main thing that i disliked during the fmx was uh when you'd when i probably when i first ever backflipped after the foam pit and you would uh backflip and you'd have to go around to different places and backflip when you first actually start doing it it's so scary <laughs> yeah. jumping in the backflip uh, yeah. into the foam pit no no oh, jump, doing oh, a backflip in a new spot oh okay so yes. yeah. until you they say until you do about 500 backflips you're going to be very 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 nervous wow so you have to do a lot of backflips before it becomes kind of second nature like walking as you say would you ever have gotten up to 500 over those yeah years? easy wow so on the first day i ever backflipped into a foam pit i ended up going to um a dirt landing and i backflipped over 30 times that first day to be able to try and get some of them nerves out wow i think that was the during the motorcycle the freestyle career that was definitely the most scariest time, I think. When Where are these foam pits? So they're not in your backyard. They're obviously at a commercial type center. Yeah, so a lot of the top freestyle riders in Australia, have to, you have to be able to be able to get in with them, I guess, to be able to meet them and um, show. They don't just let anyone come over and jump into them, obviously, because it's unsafe. So you really need to be get to the top of the sport without doing a backflip, and then you earn that respect as such and be able to uh, come into them places where you can actually try the new tricks and uh, progress from there. So these are like, you know, privately owned uh, yeah, setups. Yeah, yeah. So it's like the um, the Matt Shubrings of the world. Um, he was a top freestyle motocross rider in Australia and uh, he helped me out a lot with his foam pit and um, he'd been around for a long time and he'd helped me out a, a lot in my freestyle career. And there's people like Robbie Madison, people like that, yeah. Yeah, and these were names that you sort of were, you, both yourself and Tyrone were looking to as you were young. Yeah, yeah. Riders. So we'd look into them, and then being able to ride with them and learn off them was uh, it was cool. It was a amazing. Dream come true. Yeah, that's in, it. in many ways. Yeah, for yeah, sure. That's really cool. Um, Morgan, what's one bit of advice you'd give to people looking to perform at their physical best? Um, probably like I said at the start of the start of the show, we do really need to uh, we need to set goals for ourselves, and we really need to uh, set realistic goals but also don't make your goals so easy that you're going to get there within the time frame that you need to or the time frame that you want to like my goals at the moment are huge and i understand that's going to take me a long time to get there and just doing the work day in and day out is the hardest thing when you don't feel like you see the progress and sometimes you do sometimes you don't but most of the time day in and day out it just feels like it becomes monotonous and uh, the progression is always happening whether you can see it or not. 
And I think trying to connect the dots looking forward is the hardest thing to do. Connecting the dots looking backwards is always easier. But uh, always have a goal set where you can uh, try and strive towards. So you need to put them dots out to be able to be able to reach them, to be able to draw a line. Terrific. And Morgan, um, what's on your bucket list for your, uh, I mean, your sporting life? You mentioned the CrossFit Games. Um, is that the uh, is, that's that's is that the the pinnacle, or is there more? Yeah, it's definitely the pinnacle. If I was able to, if I am able to make it to the CrossFit Games, it'll definitely be a, f- a few years before that time comes around. But uh, just being able to make regionals, or even to be able to compete at the best I can compete, and know that it's the best and all I can give, I think. I'll be happy with that for sure. And, and the difference between where you are now and, and that being the, the, the pinnacle you see, what yeah. needs to change for you? Time. I need a lot of time to create, uh, to gain a lot of strength, a lot of uh, training and a lot of uh, muscular endurance kind of stuff. Um, it just takes time. Like with everything, mm. right, driving, riding a car, riding a bike, driving a car, walking. Yeah. To get better at it, you just need to continue to do it. Yeah, so. it's... You know, time. Um, you know, I often speak to runners, and one of the questions they ask me, Morgan, is, uh, you know, how do I get better at running? And <laughs> without sounding trite, it's, you know, it can often be, well, how much are you running? And if you want to get good at running, there's no substitute for running. Yeah, that's, um, that's so correct. It's like time in the in the saddle, right? Um, Morgan, uh, in terms of uh, bucket list life items outside of sport, um, I, I think I want a road trip with my wife. So I want to uh, be able to road trip around Australia when we get a little bit older and I stop training as much. I want to be able to uh, re- take her on a bit of a journey around Australia all, over- all overseas. I've travelled all across America a few times and I'd really love to take her across and uh, hire an RV and just set off on an adventure, I think, and just really enjoy ourselves, just the two of us. And what do you want to be remembered for? Um, I just want to be remembered being a good husband, I think. I think that's the biggest thing I want to be now. You can have all your sports, you can have all your trophies, you can have everything you have, but uh, I really would just want to be a good husband to my wife and a good good family man, I think. A good person that's always there for my friends and my family, I think, yeah. Mate, on that note, <laughs> thanks for popping by and being on the Physical Performance Show. Awesome, thank you, Brad. So, there you have it. I trust you enjoyed that episode with Morgan Jilks, an impressive young guy who's overcome some great adversity. If you enjoyed the show, please jump over, leave a review on iTunes. The reviews just help this show be more visible for more people who are just like you, seeking physical best performance. If you'd like a copy of the show notes, you know what to do. Jump over to pogophysio.com.au. Uh, you can download them there. All the links are available also. If you've got any questions, comments, guys, find me over on Twitter, at Brad underscore beer. If you'd like more physical performance tips, be sure to jump over to pogophysio.com.au and uh, subscribe to the weekly Pogo Press. You'll also pick up two free chapters of my Amazon running and jogging bestseller, You Can Run Pain Free. Guys, if you've got any guests or athletes that you think you'd like to be focused or um, featured, I should say, on the Physical Performance Show, be sure to let me know just on social media at Brad underscore Beer, and uh, we'll do our best to see if we can uh, get them on the show to share their stories. I appreciate the messages that have been coming through and the feedback of the show so far with specific uh, guests that people have uh, recommended, and it's really, really great. So thank you, guys. Really appreciate everyone's support out there. I'm very open to feedback, too, so if there's any way that uh, you'd like to share with me that the show can be improved, once again, and just drop it over to my social media handle there at Brad underscore beer uh, or alternately you can drop me an email b.beer b-e-e-r at pogophysio.com.au coming up in next week's episode of the physical performance show I catch up with an Australian distance running legend Craig Buster Mottram Craig's accolades in the running world are outstanding four Olympic games a world championship medal in the 5,000 metres on the track. This is one class athlete who really opens up and shares around his stories and journey of becoming an elite Australian running legend. So you're going to really enjoy that next episode. Be sure to tune in. Until next time, keep pursuing your physical best. 
I'm Brad Beer, and this has been the Physical Performance Show.